All right, good afternoon. I'm Michael Thomas, director of the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, thank you for joining our ongoing series of digital workshops. We, of course, miss seeing all of you in person at our center at the DMA, but I'm pleased that so many of you keep joining uh, our virtual sessions. Uh, it seems like more and more every week or every time we do it. Uh, I wanted to take this moment to mention another component of our digital programming entitled Falling and Rising Public Monuments and Cultural Heritage in a Time of Protest. This digital series presents interviews with art historians, historians, artists, and even archaeologists uh, that examine the current cultural moment of renewed attention to the role of public art. You can find the link to those interviews on the EODIA webpage. It's right on the front page. Or we're also sharing uh, a link in the Zoom chat as I speak. So uh, please, please tune in. They're recorded. They're some, anywhere from they're right around half hour to 45 minutes. So they're an easy, quick uh, morning uh, listen or watch. Uh, so I hope uh, that you get a, or any time of day really, that you get a chance to, uh, to tune in. Okay, so before I introduce today's speaker, I will ask that everyone else please turn off your video and mute your microphone. And I will also ask our speaker to please share her screen now. And I Can see- Can you see it, Michael? I do see it. Great. Okay, so uh, for most of you here, now, today's speaker requires no introduction. Uh, Bonnie Pittman has been a member of the University of Texas at Dallas community since 2012, uh, where she's held the position of research professor and distinguished scholar in residence, and where she's also the director of Art Brain Innovations at the Center for Brain Health. A former director of the Dallas Museum of Art, she has been a curator, administrator, and educator at numerous museums across the country. Through the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History here at UT Dallas, she has focused her research and teaching on art in medicine and the power of observation, designing a framework that introduces the neuroscience of seeing and develops new skills for seeking and processing information to make new connections and to retain ideas and observation. She also teaches at UT Southwestern Medical School, uh, a UT Southwestern Medical School class uh, that develops close observation of works of art to enhance the diagnostic skills needed for medical practice. Since 2019, Bonnie has been working with the National Sculpture Center on a highly successful art and health programs, series of art and health programs. Today, uh, she will present Artist's Response in a Pandemic. Please welcome Bonnie Pittman. Well, thank you, Michael, for that generous introduction. And I'm so happy to see so many friends uh, that have joined in for today's conversation. And I uh, want to start off by thanking, of course, EODIA for the opportunity to present this material and to uh, the two people that have helped to make it happen. Uh, Megan Briefus has been my uh, assistant since uh, May, working with me on this particular project and also one on meditation and art. And she has helped to accumulate the artists and has learned a great deal in this process. And then Katrina Saunders, who works with the Eodia Institute and is a magician in terms of technology and making things uh, look beautiful on the screen has been an invaluable part of the process. So without them, um, this would be misspelled and probably a little less attractive, but thanks to them, uh, the great research is showing up and we're happy to show it with you this afternoon. And I pushed forward and it didn't go forward. Okay, so where is the bar? All right, how do I get that out? I'm having a technical difficulty here uh, of advancing my slides because my, what is it called, is in the way. There we go, we fixed it. Always happy, just keep pushing buttons, my son always says. 
Well, this afternoon is really divided into three segments. Uh, the first part, I'm going to give you some background in history about the Spanish flu and also COVID virus, which we're dealing with today. And that is because of all the pandemics that I've studied. These two have the best similarities and were um, really worldwide, not only in terms of the death tolls uh, that we are experiencing, but also had similar conditions that arise in the body uh, dealing with the viruses. The second part of the uh, presentation is really a group of contemporary artists who have created work basically since March of this year and are responding to the COVID virus based on different ideas or themes. And Megan and I have organized those um, those into five themes which we'll get to in a minute and then of course the last part is your uh, questions and i hope that you uh, ask a lot of questions because um, we want to be provocative and encourage people to participate and if you have one that you can't uh, wait on then just uh, let um, just put a note in the chat room and the person monitoring that uh, chat room, who I think is Heather, will um, send me a text or get to me some way. So let's begin. Um, the first part of this is, uh, uh, this is a, a story of human tragedy that seems to keep repeating itself, which is uh, kind of difficult to imagine. Uh, the Spanish flu, or the flu, uh, which was an H1N1 virus, uh, affected the entire world in 1918 to 1920. And this is one of hundreds of documentary photographs in the archives that illustrate how um, police uh, had to wear protective gear. It killed, and you can see the statistics, a, a quarter of the world's population. And but by the time COVID virus uh, ends, that could be a similar number. Right now, we're very, very high. 50 to 100 million deaths, and that's a complicated number because of World War I and how it affected uh, the death counts. It um, very importantly, and I think you all know this by now, did not start in Spain. Um, they, they had an open press, Spain did, and we're talking about the virus, and other countries like Germany had banned it, and so there was a lot of concern as to uh, not nobody, no country wants to be labeled as the virus, but in this case, it came to be known uh, euphemistically as the Spanish flu. And the big spreader, of course, of the H1N1 virus was World War I and the back and forth motion of the troops and also the health conditions that were in existence. The portrait on the right is by, um, excuse me, by Edvard Munch, and Edvard says, he uh, he uh, did this after he uh, completed the flu, and he was he's in recovery. And you can see this incredibly gaunt face of his, and hollowed out eyes, and very frail, weak body, which many of us know about from uh, people who have the virus and are slowly recovering. He uh, did uh, ultimately died a few years later, but he always blamed this. And he had many, many figures of death in his work. And he often represents that sort of wide-eyed, hollowed out figure. I also want to point out the sort of acidic colors that are in the background. And this is a very light uh, brush strokes that are around there. It's something that he did uh, quickly to remind him of the experience that he had suffered through. There are many features and symptoms to the uh, Spanish virus or H1N1. And in this particular case, they did not have electron microscopes at that time. And they, uh, so this sample that you can see of a slide in the center, sorry about that, is illustrated as a, uh, was taken from samples that were preserved and later analyzed by physicians. It attacks the respiratory system just the way uh, the COVID virus does. As we know, it was highly contagious and airborne transmission. And you can see a lot of the symptoms there, which are very, very familiar to us today um, in terms of our uh, friends and family who have been affected by the virus. 
This is just showing the first 263 days of the virus, how quickly it spread around the world. And the hot spots in the beginning were in Europe, uh, parts of Africa and the United States, but it was just little dots. And then all of a sudden, very quickly, um, uh, 82 days later, look at the map with the one below, and it's just staggering to see how quickly the virus spread. And it was at a time, this was produced by the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation as he demonstrated how quickly the uh, coronavirus could also spread. The same protective gear that we have today is what was used then, and that is the um, PPE, the a mask, gloves, and isolation were really cri critically needed and washing your hands all the time. And this is an advertisement in one of the newspapers just demonstrating uh, what nurses and doctors but were doing, but also emphasizing others needed to do it. And you can see the list of concerns and worries and actions that you can take. I mentioned that uh, one, there are several versions about where, uh, there versions to the story about where the coronavirus uh, took off. In the United States, uh, Army troops came back from World War I and they were out in Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, there are two ideas about what happened to cause the virus to uh, become a super spreader out there. One is that troops came home from uh, from France and Germany, and they were uh, put up at the barracks, and they had were already con had the a virus. And another one was that it could have come from the swine farms in the neighborhood. Whatever, wherever it came from, it had devastating effects. And this is a photograph of the uh, army barracks in set up an emergency hospital, just exactly the way uh, that we're seeing them being set up in the United States and Wisconsin today. And um, unfortunately, a lot of people are not wearing masks, which is going to cause a further spread of the flu. Of the, uh, flu. But what is important to note is that this is only three, uh, it was about two weeks after the outbreak at Fort Riley, how quickly it affected them. There are a lot of health improvements that came from <clears throat> this, from dealing with the pandemics. And I, uh, the whole notion of promoting healthcare for everybody, trying to, uh, trying to get them to wear masks and quarantine, it was really, really used. The health um, epidemiology, which we take as a science today, absolutely did not exist at that time. Scientists through development of microscopes and sharing information began to understand how diseases were cultivated and carried. And today it is a major part, as you can see, of the medical practices. Um, the systematic gathering of data helped people to understand what the deaths and illnesses were like. So it was a, a lot of changes in health practices at, the, at that time. The painting on the right is by Egon Schiele, and it's actually a very sad painting because he was only 26 or 27 when it was painted at the peak of his uh, beginning of his career. And he paints his entire family, his young wife and their baby. And very quickly um, after the wife and baby got the uh, Spanish flu, then they died. And about a week later, then Egon Schiele died in the, at the height of his career. So many great artists have been lost to us uh, through these epidemics and pandemics over the year. And this was especially important over the um, bubonic plague, which harvested um, brilliant people throughout the Ren Renaissance. There are a lot of economic and cultural impacts that take place. And the uh, spread of the virus, as I said, really impacted uh, the workforce, which we don't always think about, combined with World War II, who, which took a large number of young men out of the workforce. And the deaths in these ages resulted in lower populations. In a Over a couple of years, it took a while for um, the population to start procreating at the level that it had been. It's about a decade later that the birth, there were lots of births, and I'm not saying that, but it just, there weren't enough men. And um, more importantly, women went into the workforce, especially into the health organizations. Uh, cultural organizations stayed open, uh, although many closed for short periods of time, but mostly for morale. And as I said, there was this great debate over um, 
Germany blamed Spain, Spain, <laughs> uh, Spain, everybody blamed Germany for everything at that time, but it was uh, really the World War I spread of, of troops going back and forth over the, uh, over the Atlantic and back and forth across the borders. Another interesting uh, issue that came up, which is parallel to today, is the racial inequity available in medical care. And Megan read a lot about this in her, in her research. And we just wanted to uh, remind you of that because it is a tragedy um, that has been going on in our country for a long time. These are just photographs uh, from uh, newspapers that document how, how much people wore their masks, which was, is a good thing, and we just wish more Americans would do the same. And the impact on schools in influenza and in the, uh, in the children. And many parents kept their children home, but largely they went to school because parents needed to work, which is the same issue as today. There's a lot more to say about the Spanish flu, but we will um, leave it and move on to the coronavirus. And of the many pictures that came out about a month or two after the coronavirus uh, struck and all the major attractions and streets, you know, whether it was Eiffel Tower or um, Times Square, this one hit me the hardest when you see Disneyland completely vacant. It is a powerful image of the uh, Disneyland castle and without a single soul, no Mickey, no, no Minnie anywhere. But it you know, speaks to the American spirit that at that moment, we were all trying to keep uh, safe from the COVID virus. This was in the early days of quarantine. Family, it's a fa as I said, uh, the H1N1 virus has been around for a long time. Um, it is very powerful. It spreads very easily in all of its variations. This morning, uh, when I woke up and put in the numbers of cases and deaths from the uh, from internationally and then from the United States, uh, and went down to rest a little bit before this talk, all of those numbers had changed, and they were all higher. So the death rate in the United States is now over, uh, is now into the thousands every day, and they're projecting that if the surge, as I think it was 31, uh, no, 39 states of uh, increased cases loads happening. And many hospitals are at 90 90% uh, capacity. It means they won't be able to sustain uh, the increase in virus that's coming this fall. There are other major strains, um, and I just give some of these these SARS and MERS, which uh, affected us in the past 20 years. The COVID symptoms, as I said, are very similar to the ones that we saw with the. Um, Spanish flu, uh, it is also, when I mentioned about the pigs being a uh, transmitter of the disease, the similar thing is being said about the coronavirus that could have start, started with some of the wild animals that were sold at markets in China. Um, it also spreads very easily and it uh, can, as we now know, go human to human through respiratory droplets. The one of the distinguishing differences between the two is uh, the loss of taste and smell. And as you as we go into the fall, that is one of the questions a lot of doctors ask you about. It's also a way to distinguish between uh, coronavirus and uh, the common flu. So if you start to get that symptom, that's apparently not a good thing. It uh, doesn't happen in everybody, so don't count on that, but stay in touch with your physicians is the main message here. My friend Arlene Schecht, who's a wonderful artist in New York, uh, uh, did this beautiful glass piece of uh, the, what she idealized as the coronavirus, just as a, a mandala. She's a practicing Buddhist, and this was a way for her to incorporate that imagery into her understanding of the virus, and it looks almost like a, a jewel. It, um, it will eventually affect, they expect, 40 to 70% of the world population. Um, the other dismaying thought is that we've been through all the downturn in the American economy and the layoffs and the unemployment, more of that may happen. And again, as we've seen very broadly reported in the uh, press in the United States, the imp impact on um, African Americans and Hispanics has been disproportionate. Um, and it is something that our country needs to pay attention to, how we treat people all equally. 
So now we're into the second section of the talk and we are going to look at a group of artists that Megan and I categorized in these sections so that you would have an understanding of some of the themes that we see going out into the artistic community. There are many, many, many more slides and artists working in this area than I could possibly show you. And just as an example to keep our talk tight today, I had to cut out 10, 10 slides of different artworks to keep it on pace. And so, you know, there's a lot more to know and learn about, and I encourage you to do that. The first one is a very important uh, task that came to the physicians right away. And that was to use science to, uh, scientists wanted to visualize the coronavirus. And he, this is an artistic representation, so it's not a scientific one, but how a, an, an artist who is uh, taken the form of the earth and then use that to show on top of it, the coronavirus itself reaching out. Um, these are artistic renderings of the coronavirus itself. But it's a really Elisa Eckhart, who is the medical illustrator for the CDC, who helped to um, illustrate both in three dimensions and uh, through uh, graphic illustrations, the uh, coronavirus with a team of experts. And it's, this is the one that you see variations of this form, but this is the one that is used to understand the coronavirus. You might wonder what all those little dots are. And uh, excuse me here, oh, sorry. Apologize. All right, patience. Um, there is Alyssa with her a wonderful group of university uh, students who worked on this scientific uh, illustration with her, and you can see on the um, excuse, and you can see on the left that each of the colored nodules represent a different protein, which is part of what they track in these infections, and. To be absolutely clear, there is no color in the coronavirus. This is what she, uh, ex how she exemplified it with the desire to show the changes in the rate of growth in the different proteins and where they potentially were located. So it's a whole art combination of art and science. Another artist who's been working with science scientists is Luke Germain. And he is, uses glass to demonstrate uh, to scientists the three dimensions of the virus because his works, they can see inside the virus what the different forms are. And the, to the uh, left, it's the Zika virus, uh, which looks very different than the coronavirus today. And <clears throat> he uses this and does this in glass forms. And you can see on the inside of the coronavirus here, things that you can't see in Alyssa's work. This helps him uh, help scientists to understand the virus and also to communicate to the public. And I'm just going to turn on the video here because it only takes a minute um, and he'll speak and talk about this. I've been creating these glass microbiology um, models since 2004. Um, but eight weeks ago, I was contacted by a university over in America to create COVID-19 to sort of visualize their research. Um, and this was before the pandemic really kind of took hold. So the, the, the sculpture's been completed. There you go. Um, okay, so, and this is a work that Luke has done more recently, and it is a memorial to the um, people who have died uh, from the coronavirus. So he, as a practicing artist, he, he is still creating these. And you can see the coronavirus form um, demonstrated here with these white flags of hope and loss. Okay, now we're not happy again. Um, the first of our themes is safety. Very important. Um, how do we prevent the spread of the coronavirus? And Banksy, um, we're going to see a, a variety of artists who have worked in different medias regarding this. And this wonderful image of, uh, by Jennifer Potter of uh, social distancing in the San Francisco Mission Dist District. She was inspired after she came home from grocery shopping because it was the first uh, she was reminded of how people in the community stay together, but they wave from balconies and they um, laugh together and they socialize, but they can't physically get together. Another uh, example of this is uh, there was a girl 
with a pierced uh, eardrum, but also uh, we know this is the Vermeer girl pearl earring that was done in Bristol, uh, England. And then they think Banksy came along, but we don't know, but the addition added the mask out of fa fabric. And so a lot of, a lot of classic art um, has been adapted as we saw in the first slide with Mona Lisa. Uh, the loss of touch and being with a family is very much articulated in the photographs of Eleanor Karachi. There are a whole host of them, but you can see her, the mother here kissing her um, son, but the son not being able to interact with her. And she speaks eloquently in her in the article about how this loss of meaningful kisses and touches has given the world a, a different feel. Another artist who responded rapidly, she was in, I think, one of the very first ones that Megan and I found was Lu is Lucia, Lucia Herrero. And she has pulled a number of objects uh, that are commonly used in, um, in the um, caretaking of ourselves and the people around us, the Clorox wipes and the sponges and uh, so forth. And then she's included, of course, an image of um, Christ in the picture, reminding us that cleaning is an important role from a, for all of us, but it is also the phrase cleanliness is go close to godliness. And these collages um, and also media, the multimedia, the where she take photo images and push them together is very typical of her art. Kimberly Klesser uh, did this a wonderful piece, I think. She is an artist, artist who does furniture and very creative works in her of. But in this case, she has tried to demonstrate that uh, uh, she created a bench that demonstrates exactly what six feet of uh, distance is. So you can see the tape measure and the yellow right there measuring the two bodies apart. And then the little burrowed out areas for you to sit in and communicate to passer buyers. But you get a sense of the physicality of what social distancing really means. Another approach to this was Annette Rohn, and she is pictured on the very far right. She came up with an idea of having four artists in different parts of the country take an image that she drew and redo it in, um, in <coughs> excuse me, in um, chalk. And they each made a chalk mural in different parts of the country, Sacramento, Atlanta, and Seattle, and sent digital images of that back to Anna. And then she combined them into this wonderful work of art, which is very popular um, uh, out there, especially ex giving another example of collaboration. Carrie Mae Weems is everywhere, to be perfectly honest. She is an artist who is, uh, you can see her posters all over the North Texas area. And what is exciting about her work is that she speaks um, both to social justice and the need for us to uh, address those issues and also to the changes that are needed regarding the COVID virus and being safe and washing your hands, et cetera. This is one of the uh, murals. You'll see a little, uh, another version of this. But it's a poster, uh, you know, as you drive down the highway that you can see of artists and her friends and, and talking overtly about someday we will hold hands again. Apologize for that. Um, and then here right now, if you go down to the Dallas Museum of Art, you'll see Carrie Mae Weems' work. And there are three posters in a row on the wall out near the DeSouvereau Plaza. And these are on the right hand side are depictions of the of what it, they say in Spanish and England, English, excuse me. She also has done these uh, powerful posters about um, how people of color have been affected and how we need to look at these numbers uh, with sadness, but also to begin to take action. The public responses are huge, and I've only taken one slide to show some of that, um, the way people, ordinary people respond in uh, to the coronavirus. And here is a, a two wall drawings uh, that, that were created. Robert Kanick took the very famous hands of Michelangelo that Michelangelo painted of uh, Christ, uh, no, excuse me, of Adam and God. And in the hand of God, he gives the pur Purell um, squirt bottle that's being handed out. And then the um, 
on the right hand side is our superhero nurse who is looking up to the sky very much like Superman. But in, uh, this is done in a downloadable print so that many new pieces can be distributed around the country. And this appropriation of images is, is quite common. Another example of this is in India, where um, it's the second most infected country in the world. And right now, the need for people to wear uh, masks in close quarters and to um, deal with what the many changes are in the country uh, is exemplified here by a, the uh, wall drawing, the wall. And then you see the graffiti painting behind a young man who I'm very happy to say is wearing a mask. Fear. Remember back in, uh, back in February and March when we were all afraid we were going to run out of, of uh, toilet paper. Um, that was a big scare. And who could better explain that than um, a Gollum out of the Lord of the Rings, my precious, my, my precious. But here's a uh, uh, draw, uh, mural that was done in Germany and it, uh, it painted and it was uh, on the walls and it's just for me I think humor is important to bring into these conversations. Rashid Johnson is an American artist who uh, is done work in about anxiety something that has really manifested itself for him right now and he has done this uh, tremendously inner energized and uh, intense works using brilliant, brilliant red um, oil uh, markers and oil paint to catch uh, the power of the move of his hand moving and also of the imagery. And as you begin to look at them, they're slightly, uh, you see people looking out the windows, what's really going on, and um, so what is it? His earlier work in uh, early 2019 was, um, is depicted in the, these these works here, and you can see that they have that same kind of intensity, but very importantly, what's different is the lack of color, and now that brilliant red really heightens the feeling of anxiety, and sort of they even look more intense than the one that we're um, looking at, than, than these earlier works, which speak to isolation and anxiety. A very different approach was taken by Alex Rockman, who uh, is a well-regarded artist uh, in the realist style. And he, in this one picture, took the theme of uh, the sinking of the uh, Titanic as being one of the well-documented human tragedies, which if only they had had more lifeboats, more people would have been saved. The 3,000 that died, um, they, they, more of them could have survived. But the, um, then he adds the humor of the the little kitties and the rat and the rat in the foreground and you begin to look and you see in the background people in beds and the more you begin to look at the detail of the ship you, be, you see references of the COVID-19. COVID Oops, sorry. Um, a lot of his work, uh, Alex Rockman's work is very fanciful. fanciful. He has surfing dogs and chickens on the left, but uh, from a series he did about Hawaii before the pandemic really took hold. But his work today is these intensely colored um, stories about uh, what's happening in our lives and the changes that are happening as a result of the COVID virus, the lockdown, the loss of life, um, the riots, everything. And he's seeing the interconnectedness, as he says in uh, the statement above, between life, biodiversity, and the and ha habitat loss. I think among the works that we're going to show you, one of them that's the saddest to me is the work by Hank Thomas, not because um, he is sad, but because he, he has taken a, a focus on the uh, incarcerated prisoners. In, and so what that means is that his writings, uh, he's an, a graphic artist who also uh, does illuminated text on walls. And you can see some examples of this on the right. Uh, this is more than anything else is talking about the people that are in prisons and our fear, the fear that they are experiencing. And he was able to interview and get comments from them and use those comments in this work of art. So there's an immediacy, even though this is, quote unquote, the hall of justice. 
Kara Walker, a very well-known artist to all of us, uh, and a work that's very typical of hers is shown below. But she's been deeply affected by the uh, pandemic, and she speaks very powerfully to this. You can read it as I um, begin to describe the work. Um, she has just been um, de devastated emotionally by the um, by the COVID virus and has illustrated that in the uh, drawing that she did over here. You see on the very center, a person huddled up almost like a fetus trying to protect themselves and around them, is that the fetus or is that the coronavirus? It's left to interpretation. And then on the right side, you see the figure of death with infected lungs coughing and laughing. And on the left side, you see this powerful figure of a, of a, Wonder Woman uh, coughing out, I would expect, the virus and saying she has a bad hair day. So it's the narrative structure of a number of these works that is so complex and has changed the way artists are doing their storytelling when they are an artist like Kara Walker and the impact on them physically and emotionally. Here, public responses are um, good examples. If you have um, attention deficit, uh, disorders and you're washing your hands or doing repeated motions over and over again, it is deeply affected uh, individuals with this disease. And that is because the very thing that they're trying to not do is being encouraged to do. And so there's been a sweeping he mental health um, uh, and anxiety. Um, the doctors are uh, treating many, many more patients of all different uh, types of with all different types of needs, but this is just one. Um, the other slide that's up there is different and it refers to, excuse me, Judy Shape, uh, 80, Judy Shape, an 81 year old senior diagnosed in Kirkland, Washington, and she was in her nursing home and was one of the early, a nursing home that uh, where over 29 people died at the time that this photograph was taken by her daughter. But that poignancy and isolation, the hand being put up against the wall is something you'll see as a human expression. I am here, I want to touch you. And of course you can't. These, this is the tragedy of our times. Thank you. Um, isolation is the next uh, chapter that we're going to look at with Banksy and um, Mark Bradford and this uh, beautiful image right here of a poster. My, we are, I didn't touch anything. This has happened to me before. Um, Banksy's wife has had it with him and she wants him out of the house as he points out there. But the little rat that occupies the um, <clears throat> his bathroom is everywhere. And uh, you can see the days being counted down and the funny little creature making a mess and jumping in all different directions. He is uh, best known for tagging with rats and he did that in the New York subways. Uh, Mark Bradford, who has a, a, had a big retrospective over at the Fort Worth Modern, you'll note, recognize it, these works if you've seen the retrospective. We also had a big one at the D Dallas Museum of Art when I was the director. And Mark is this tall, um, over, well over, he's almost six foot six, gangly, kind, gentle, quiet person who um, has really found a, that the isolation has affected him deeply. And he ended up doing these three large canvases in a warehouse near him. You can see by the intensity of the paint and the structures and the layers and layers and layers of color that are on them, <coughs> that he is, he is into these paintings and he's having to produce them largely on his own. <coughs> Excuse me, I have to take a sip. If you look at the imagery in this one, and you, rem and you did get to see his Fort Worth paintings, you'll re remember that he does a lot of work with maps. And in this regard, it's about the merging and uh, convening of the maps and that we have to keep moving, life has to keep moving, but things are getting blurrier and more intense. <clears throat> Another artist who has taken a very different approach is George Kondo, and he is, uh, in, uh, in a home away from New York City. And he has decided to really focus in on the separation of people. So his drawings that we're gonna be seeing here demonstrate that um, the physicality of separating from the people that we love. Uh, the 
beautiful um, colored illustration really gets a sense of that. As you can see, three different views of the um, uh, one of one person and, and uh, the, that's the white hair and then on the black hair is the other person. But this distortion and rearrangement of individuals represents that timing and loss that's going on in so many of our worlds and why he calls this group parallel lives or disentangled figures to remind us of these separations. Rihanna Matar is a photographer that we discovered and um, she, uh, you can read her statement over here, but she is in Washington, um, uh, Massachusetts. But specifically, she's taken a series of wonderful painting, uh, photographs of people in their windows as being one of the ways that we can connect is looking out the windows and, and seeing our neighbors. I apologize for what's going on. And we'll try again. This is just not happy today. Um, she also here, as I was saying, she has done these windows and you can see in some cases where lovers are touching each other um, and other cases where the child is isolated, might be coming to visit a family member or a grandparent. Um, many of us know we have not touched our children, our grandchildren, our friends for you know now on to seven months. The glories of being out in the sun, which I love that war one, and then family, uh, family caught inside and not being able to get out, but wanting to connect with you. Another artist is Ernest, Ernesto Munoz, and Ernesto is, uh, <clears throat> lived in Mexico, but also, and has done a lot of mural work down there, but he was in Spain at this time. And this incredible uh, sort of drawing or, or wall uh, he created in Madrid speaks to the heart of the COVID virus. You can see instead of in the Madonnas, uh, where her heart normally is, is the pounding COVID virus that she's pointing to. Usually that's a bleeding heart. You see her completely um, decked out in um, protective equipment, goggles, face mask, and so forth, and her hair covered. And then behind her, instead of have a glowing uh, halo, she has the earth to remind us very much of uh, the impact that the virus is having. Here's a detail on the left and then a, the full expanse of a, of a quarantine work that he did of uh, Adam and Eve. And it's so detailed, it's hard to really um, pick out sections, but we tried to give you a close up of the chest and loins of Adam and Eve. And you can see the virus attacking their lungs. You can see the, they're both wearing protective gear. Um, then you see the little devils moving in different directions, you know, aggravating the virus. It is the virus all around them? You see skeletons on the sides of both of them speaking about the mortality. And then you begin to notice funny little things like giraffes and dogs and cats. And that all speaks to, you know, the, that life goes on very importantly, and yet um, the virus is with us at every point. And this was, these are uh, powerful, powerful images that again, we found on the web. And an artist who has taken, taken the theme of isolation is uh, in Northern Italy was uh, Paolo Pellegrin. And he, uh, this is his little daughter running into the distance uh, playing with a tree because she's not allowed to play with her play, uh, other playmates. And she is, um, you know, now that is her playmate. And so this is the first time that we've begun to see, and there are many, many photographs of this pointing out the isolation and its impact on people. On the other side, while he also depicts sort of that sense of isolation and loneliness in the left-hand side, he does one of the few very joyous figures that I found, <clears throat> capturing his wife and daughter laughing. And I can tell you from my research at the Center for Brain Health, laughter and joy is a very important part of coronavirus uh, healing. So if you can find those moments and encourage people to um, stay in them for a few minutes, it really does help your brain. Um, I am very excited to have found that picture. The public responses, of course, have been tremendous, um, whether we are encouraging the lockdown or cartoons that show don't let the coronavirus into your home, or my favorite is this sorry we're closed sign over the world. It is uh, graphic designers and artists of all backgrounds are very heavily into producing uh, images for, um, for us to understand. 
We're now into the last section of the, of the talk, and I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, it's going to talk about gratitude, the ways we give thanks to our um, caregivers and the people who we work with, and the computer just seems to have a life of its own. Apologize. Uh, right now we're looking at Bangsky, who did this beautiful drawing of a little boy playing with a superhero nurse, and he left behind Batman and the robots. So that is a pretty typical of, of how children are reimagining play. Sarah Cardona, who is one of the artists with the Nasher Window series this summer, did a, chose to do a series of pinatas with 12 points on them um, to <clears throat> remind us of joy and happiness. Also, when you break a pinata open, um, it, it breaks apart and dispels the evil um, around it. So it represented many different things. Uh, the other artist who uh, worked on this was Jenny Holzer, who did the moving image uh, that you see here. Unfortunately, I couldn't download that, but it is one of her typical Jenny Holzer, one word comes up at a time and then you get to read the whole thing. And it says, in a dream, you saw a way to survive and you were filled full of joy. That's the truth. Children, adults, uh, workers in their, in their uh, offices have all tried to find ways to thank the workers, whether it's um, truck drivers or cashiers or people in the healthcare industry. And those uh, thank yous are well received. But if you talk to any of the people that are being thanked, they would tell you if people would only wear masks and wash their hands, the virus would begin to come under control. So how has COVID affected our communities, um, in, especially in the art world? It's had a tremendous impact, uh, tremendous. And as you know, museums and galleries, art fairs, everything closed down in early March. And some museums have opened um, nationally and internationally, but they have only done so with limited visitations, time tickets so that they don't get overcrowded. And that is really critical both for the visitors and also for the um, staff of the museums. Layoffs, furloughs, pay cuts in every museum that I can think about. Um, Dallas Museum of Art has not done that, nor has the Nasher, uh, but it has, uh, or the Crow, I don't think, but many museums have, and they're having to cut their budgets by millions and millions of dollars. So prudent management and endowments are helping a number of places to stay in good shape. The art fairs have pretty much all been postponed, postponed or canceled through the spring of 2021. And I bet it won't happen again until late next fall that the big fairs will reopen. I'm very grateful to the many people who have uh, set up a wonderful artist relief funds and there are hundreds of them around the country. So if you haven't thought about giving um, or what can, when you ask yourself, what can I do? You can give, you can give your um, uh, resources, a small check, $5 um, to a museum or to an artist relief fund. They all need money because the fundraising uh, capabilities are so diminished right now. The last uh, couple of slides are, where is this information coming from? Well, one, we searched all the art journals and every day it changed. And as we got closer to the presentation, more and more artists were identified. Um, the second thing is I'm a great Instagram follower and there are, they, we're gonna show you three sites which you can go on Instagram and follow and see, you know, every kind of artist uh, producing work that speaks to this um, dilemma that the uh, world is facing and deals with isolation or expressions of day-to-day um, -day living and how people are managing. The other uh, growth in sites, websites, is really, as I just mentioned, about supporting artist projects and artists around the world. And again, these are examples from all types of different people, whether they're professional artists or, you know, art consumers or art respondents, but everyone can contribute. And so if you're making art right now, I'd encourage you to, to get involved this way and, and get it posted on one of these sites to show whether your sense of empathy and understanding towards others. Well, this is the end of my talk and I am uh, pretty much on time. And I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm hoping there will be some questions on this as we um, 
we don't have a chance to say goodbye to the COVID virus, which if you're looking at this, I think has now morphed into a death mass. It is with us and will be with us. Uh, all of the reports are until late uh, in next year. My son works for the New York Times, a bellwether center for the understanding what's going on with the virus. And one of the issues, one of the things he told me last night is that the New York Times offices in Manhattan are not opening until July or later of next year. So it gives you a, some sense of um, <clears throat> the impact and how long people who are in the know of how long the virus in, uh, will happen. So with that, I'm going to uh, close out my talk and I'll stop screen sharing. There we go. What do you see? Bonnie, uh, yes. thank you so much. Uh, what, a, what an informative uh, talk. I, I, I really made, yes. uh, thank you. For everyone. Um, I would, uh, you know, I, I welcome everyone to turn their video and microphones back on. Uh, we're happy to take some uh, questions. You can either raise your hand in front of your camera or uh, uh, and, and we'll try to get to you or, or just chime in. I, I'll start uh, by, first of all, um, I, I, I'm just blown away by a, how much response that there's been right. al already. And then also by your ability to go find that uh, material. Uh, obviously you've looked at a lot of, of current artists work. And I guess my, my first question is, is what, did anything really surprise you or that you discovered or really affect you profoundly? I mean, what, what's, what's been the biggest eye opener for you in this, in this process? Well, I, I think one, the first one was in the beginning, I was saying, where is it? You know, I'm looking for it and it's not out there. And there were a few articles that were published uh, demonstrating artists responding to the COVID. And then uh, all of a sudden this kind of, the door unwrapped about May or June. And you saw, uh, again, using public media, uh, you know, social media as a platform, it just exploded on the internet and the contributions that were there. For me, the biggest surprise was um, the impact of isolation on people. And that, uh, I, um, I'm a very social human being, as many of you know, so I miss terribly being in contact with people, hugging people, talking to people. I've tried to adapt virtually, but if you can imagine um, that you don't have Zoom and you don't have Teams and you don't have all these different platforms, how do you stay in touch? And that the issues around isolation became very, very poignant to me. The, um, and I think that, as I said, the research that we did and there are probably 50 more artists we could have sh shown okay that's my t my timer says stop <laughs> but um the so that would be what i would say is just you know hang in there the hardest i think more what's interesting is many of the paintings that we saw in the uh, Spanish flu are oil paintings, very traditional oil paintings, um, and they, many of them weren't seen during the time of the Spanish flu. Now the art is out there and people are responding to it, and very importantly, the community is responding to it. Great, thank you. Uh, I would love to take questions for anyone else. Unfortunately, half of you, or more than half of you, are named uh, Katrina Saunders on this, so uh, if, uh, who is, <laughs> so if, you are not Katrina Saunders and you would like to ask a question, please identify yourself when you yeah. ask a question. So I was going to say, uh, who, who, I saw we had a question from Bruce Mao. Could, Bruce, could you unmute and ask it? Or, or it was that a chat question? I can always... It was a chat question, I think. Well, here, let me see. Uh, Is he still there, Katrina? Oh, here, I can read it. Okay. Uh, Bruce Mao asks, uh, what do you think it will take to change the American response to the virus so that we understand our individual contribution to our collective well-being? Will, will it take much higher death counts? Many of the artists seem resigned to the ever-increasing outcome. Are there artists focused on and measuring their impact? That's a good question. Oh, wow. A great question. Well, the first thing I would say, we need a new president of the United States if we're going to conquer the coronavirus. Um, 
clearly this president has not been up to the task, nor has his cabinets or any other individual in support of him. And so the rampant, uh, there's now, he made a statement today that 85% uh, of the people who wear masks get coronavirus, which is completely false. So the primary person who should be protecting us is uh, giving out the worst information. The second thing is, I think that now artists are beginning to see their voice, Bruce, and that the production of artwork is going to be more and more exciting um, to them because they see it going out there and supporting other artists or just getting the messages out. Unfortunately, I think it is a higher death toll. That is the only thing that people are beginning to understand. And the tragedy of that is it is preventable. And it is just because of people's in action and lack of real compassion or empathy for their fellow human being that we're seeing this great divide and something that should be a part of concern for every American, no matter of your faith or your background, that is caring for the people around you and caring for your community somehow has been politicized in a very tragic way. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right on with all of that. Um, uh, I since everyone's questions in the chat, half of them are coming up with Katrina Saunders. It might be nice if you would just please uh, ask your question uh, on, you know, just chime in or wave a hand or something if you want to ask a question. Uh, well, Amy, I recognize you and you actually have the right. So, uh, Amy Hoffman, what, what would you like to ask? Don't forget to unmute your uh, your mic. Okay, it was it's good now. Hi, Bonnie, that was wonderful. Hey. I'm sorry, I joined a little bit late. Um, I just wanted to mention Bailey Liu, the artist that's at The Crow, yeah. has just done a new work uh, around this time, around the coronavirus time, at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And oh, okay, great. Can uh, you send me a link to her so we can add her? In the oh, chat. Okay. I'll email it to you also. And it's, yeah, uh, email it to me. It's, it's really this beautiful cloud uh, with rain falling. Oh. So you can click on the link and see it. Oh, thank you, but, Amy. Um, it was, it's what she's been working on during this time. So right. that was kind oh, of- Oh, I'm so appreciative that you're, you're sending that to us, to me and putting it in the chat room. Um, you know, this is how the word is getting uh, spread out. And I think it's gonna be very interesting from a collecting point of view to see how curators begin to uh, gather this information and bring it together because some of it is truly ephemeral art and it will just disappear. And then they're going to have to make a selection about other kinds of art that they want to bring into their, um, into their uh, collections, guidelines. Uh, you know, many of them have, uh, don't collect public art, but that's okay. That, that can be collected by somebody else. But I think the storytelling about the coronavirus is going to go on for a long time. Um, somebody asked in the chat room, which I saw, uh, how is this affecting museums? And since you're on the line, Amy, maybe you could speak to that as the museum director at The Crow. Thank you, dear host. Well, and, and before I answer that, I would say, um, Bonnie, I feel like you as an artist have done more work in this time. I mean, I know you're giving 19 talks this fall, and I would consider that part of your portfolio of work in a way. I wonder if you would agree with that, that this has given you time to really focus on things you're interested in. Um, thank you, Amy, for mentioning that. I, I do a series, as Michael mentioned, and Amy's referring to at the uh, Nasher Sculpture Center, so you can go on their website. And this year I've done a whole talk on pandemics, the history of pandemics, five of the major ones and illustrated with works of art. And then I've done three, I have done two on mindful observation and I'm about to do the third one, which is on mindful observation in play. And so it's going to talk about works of art that have a playful attitude like Miro and then bring you into the conversation in new ways to think about the importance of your playful nature, and also gives some of the neuroscience about experience and experience-based learning and play learning. So they, those are all a combination of neuroscience and art, and I am very grateful to my sponsors also at the Center for Brain Health, where we did one on compassion, art and compassion. And so the, those, you know, I have to say this has been a very productive time for me, but it has pushed my art and medicine portfolio in very, very different directions. And many of my colleagues in the art and medicine field, meaning doctors and 
uh, museum professionals have all said that they love the variety of this because they don't think about, um, you know, we, none of us have time if you're in the midst of treating the people with a pandemic or you're running a nonprofit institution to reflect. And so for, for me, not being the director right now, this has been a time of creative reflection. <clears throat> well, and I would, I would just add that the unexpected outcome for the museums is that we've met on the phone since March 13th, maybe March 20th was our first. All of the Dallas Arts District and Greater Arts CEOs have met on the phone every Friday at 11. And it's created this real band of brotherhood and sisterhood around how do we manage all of the sort of issues that have flown at us, including the death of George Floyd and how we managed what happened in, in May. Um, but we are more connected and um, truly trusting as colleagues, you know, in the way that yes. neighbors become in a crisis. And that's, that's an outcome that has been really incredible, just the sharing of resources and the new friendships uh, <clears throat> that came out of this. Yeah. So I hope in some ways we keep those calls going. You know? Right. Well, I think there, there have been new forms of communication for all of us, the use of Zoom and and, uh, you know, the web-based uh, platforms has gone up, you know, not 10%, but 500 to 7,500%. So it is uh, a critical way of communicating. And if you haven't seen the new show at the Dallas Museum of Art, To Be Determined, I strongly recommend that you go down and see it. Um, you do have to make reservations uh, to get in, but it's a 12 curators collaborated together to create a show that touches on the themes of social injustice of the COVID of illness. Um, and so it is a way for you to, you know, re-enter the world through art. Very, very powerful show. I would also Any say not, not, not recommend, I mean, not, you know, contemporary in any way, but uh, we were, Yodia had the fortune and Amy was with us and several of the people here were with us to, of going to the, the Alonzo Barraghete show at the at the Meadows, which is just out, it's just stunningly beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so I I would, I while people are, I mean, there are things yeah. you can go see and do right, right now, and that that's a an, an excellent uh, yeah. an excellent thing. Uh, I see a question by uh, Adis Sarak. Yes. Uh, yes, Eda. Eda, sorry, uh, sorry. Hi, uh, in your presentation, you said that disadvantaged groups and minorities have been affected more during the Spanish flu. And I think it is still valid for United States, right? Black right. people, Hispanic people are more affected. In Turkey, where I am from uh, right now, workers are more affected. Right. Uh, we don't have like black, white people uh, discrimination, but we have worker groups, you know. Um, so do you think art has a power to change that for the better? Well, I think art is a universal language and works like Carrie Mae Weems and others, which are, you know, posters as you drive down the highway, you can agree or disagree with them, um, but they are in your face. And that, that's what I think it's going to take, the mask wearing and the need to take care of everybody in society, all the workers. When you th consider all the workers of all different ethnic heritage, <clears throat> heritage around the world that have gotten our food to us, that have you know, taken the meat and gotten it clean so that we can eat it, the farmers, the truck drivers, I mean, the grocery workers, it's just staggering that these people um, were essential workers. And despite what the conditions were, they had to go to work and lots of them have died. And I think that only when we when communities really address uh, that issue and show compassion for those people that real change will happen. I think in the early part of the virus here in the United States, for example, a lot of the meatpacking facilities just said, you know, this isn't, this isn't serious, this isn't a problem. But meatpacking companies have always been a problem. And some changes have, been, have really occurred over the years to improve them, but specifically this year so that the workers could work because entire plants were being shut down because of lack of um, 
a PPE for the workers and Amazon ran into trouble. I mean, you can't not take care, care of your workers in this in today's environment because the workers feel com more comfortable rising up and saying, you know, we need this equipment, we need these conditions to be improved. Thank you. So I remain hopeful always that art is the voice of the future and gives us hope for change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. Anyone, uh, anyone else have a question for Bonnie? Um, I had mailed in a question, I guess, about a week ago. Oh, wow. Well. It oh. was something along the lines of, because this has happened to me, I think it's kind of interesting, but I wonder if you find this to be common. I've become a lot more grateful for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I know everyone's talking about what they don't get to do and they don't get to have, but I've had this really, you know, well, I think, go ahead. No, gratitude is a very important um, act um, to express. And you, you know, if I had shown all the all the images of gratitude, we we could have a whole session just on gratitude because I think that is a impulse that people, you know, want to be grateful, want to thank others, especially you know the regular human beings. Remember when everybody was clanging on the pots and pans as the workers went into or they sang or all these different things. Now, seven months into it, not happening as much, but I think there'll be new waves in the winter of ways to acknowledge even tempor temporarily the great work that others are doing. From a medical point of view, gratitude is a very, very important thing for your brain and for your, for your body. Um, there are parts of your brain that light up when we practice gratitude, whether it's a gratitude journal, whether it's, you know, just saying thank you to somebody who is in line with you or a worker who has uh, checked you out at the counter. The reason for that is because it demonstrates social connection. And in a time like this, when social connections have been severed, the importance of being grateful for things and objects and people is even more, um, more, as my uh, grandson sometimes, more better, Nana, it's more better if you do that. Meaning very simply that you can't not you can, you know, saying those words, acting that way, um, looking people directly in the eye and communicating to them your appreciation of them or whether it's just those simple acts can make a huge difference, not only for them and they will remember it, but for you, for your, for your brain and body. So thank you for doing this today. Yeah, thank you. Well, oh, thank you very much, Shulay. Appreciate yes, it. Bonnie, we are all grateful to have you. Uh, I'm especially grateful. You've been an amazing person for me to get to know since I've, I've come yeah. you know, back to Dallas. And uh, we're all grateful that you took the time to, to, uh, to give this great presentation today. So uh, with that, I, I think we will uh, wrap this up. And thank you to everyone uh, for coming. Our, uh, please stay tuned in for our next. Uh, Heather, can you remind me when's our next one? Next Thursday, we have Catherine Broadbeck, um, who yeah. is a contemporary art curator at the Dallas Museum of Art. She's giving a uh, talk, same time. Um, you also have to register for, uh, for that event, but free as well. So please register and please join us next week. Uh, and do, do check out uh, the, uh, the uh, Falling and Rising. There are some great interviews with not only UTD, uh, uh, and faculty, but some some great scholars from uh, around the country, uh, and I think it's an and artist, and it's it'll be a it's a really interesting uh, 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 program. That's nice because you can sort of tune in and you know when you have a little time and then tune out. Uh, so anyway, well, thanks again, Bonnie, and thanks to all Thank of you, you, and we will see you next week. Yep. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>